We now switch to a bit more clinical issue, which is a complex but interesting and emerging uh, issue. Uh, and these are disclosures. So, uh, facing MS with all that age, they are, they, this is a very heterogeneous question. So, there is something called late onset MS with uh, uh, disease onset uh, after the age of 50 and aging with MS. And uh, as you may notice, most of the article starts that MS is usually considered a young person's disease. Maybe we have to reconsider and reformulate this, uh, this statement because our MS population is aging and due to increased life expectancy, also in the general population, but, but also in the MS population, the age of the, the peak prevalence age is shifting to later ages. However, there is also something called late onset MS, and it's rather a, a big focus on, uh, on persons with disease onset over the age of 45, 50. And this is increasing because, the, because of the um, better access to MRI, but also the diminished hesitance of the neurologists to diagnose MS in older age. As I remember for 15 years ago, we were, we were very hesitant uh, giving an MS diagnosis for persons over the 70, and most of the white metal lesions were considered vascular. So there are some um, definitions in the literature called late onset MS after the age of 50. Some of, the, some of them are over the age of 40, and very late onset MS over the age of 60. So all this confusing in the definition makes, makes the articles very, and the studies very difficult to compare. However, we talk about the heterogeneous population because there are pa patients with late onset MS, but there are also patients in progressive or relapsing phase of disease with a very different disease of duration. So there is an age of a patient and an age of a disease. So managing all these patients is a unique challenge. However, just a few slides about the epidemiology, and here a distinguish between prevalence and incidence. We know that worldwide there is a general increase in MS prevalence, also in countries which are considered low prevalence countries, uh, regardless of age. A high prevalence among individuals over age of 50 were reported from Manitoba, Canada, who also have a good epidemiological um, tradition. A study from Genoa found that 18% of the people with MS were over 65 years. And also in Australia, over the last 45 years, the prevalence of MS has increased from under 20 to 60, and the most notable increase is persons over 60. So, contributors to the prevalence increase, of course, the improvement of diagnostic tools including the availability of MRI. Also, changes in diagnostic criteria who have maybe a minor contribution, but the increased longevity of persons with MS has a huge contribution. For example, in Canada, they report a stable mortality rate over the last 35 years, but the shift of mortality age shifted to the later age ages. In Norway, and this is the most impressive uh, survival uh, reports, uh, they report a considerable improvement of survival. There is the difference between the longevity of MS people and the general population is only seven years. Uh, however, the mortality is higher in women. A substantial improvement in mortality is uh, reported from Denmark and Sweden. It's about nine to 10 years uh, lower than the uh, general population but not in the United States, where it seemed that it's very stable. However, they have ethnical differences. The mortality was higher in non-Hispanic whites and blacks. So how about incidence? So incidence, the new, the new MS cases of 100,000 population. Um, there are few studies, and the percentage is different. They are between 3 and 5 percentage of uh, persons with onset over the age of 50 or 60, and it's about, but only half to 1% of all MS diagnosis. Is this underdiagnosed? It may be, 
because the uh, availability of MRI is different in different countries, and in those countries with good epidemiological tradition, the reports are quite valid. However, we know that the presence of comorbidity at MS symptom onset, and this is, will be common in, with aging, is associated with a significant delay of the MS diagnosis, and this is shown in Canada and Denmark. So then I have some data from, fresh data from the Danish MS registry, because, um, um, we, because we, we are very preoccupied of this question. So this is the living MS population from 1970 to 2018. The red is women, the green is men, and you can see that our MS population is, in, the living MS population is increasing. We have today about 16,500 living MS patients. Then the age distribution, again, red women, green men, it's from zero to over 80. I think the oldest MS patient is, I think, 93. And as you can see, over 50, there is almost half of, there's actually half of our population is over 50. And wh why do I think that this um, data is rather valid? Because uh, Denmark is a small country, but we have, the, we have our 60 years of uh, old MS registry that started in 1948, and since then collects data on all MS patients. It's supported by the Danish MS Society, and uh, the completeness is due to the mandatory notification of all MS, um, all MS patients. So all patient has to be recorded in order to get the uh, reimbursement of DMT. We had 11,000 patients on treatment and we do not need informed consent from the patient, not even in these GDPR times. So, and if you look at development of age, then you can see also from the 70s to 2017, you can see that has been a, a, um, an increase, as this is because of the increased uh, onset and diagnosis of older pa patients who uh, push up the mean age. And F1 more, the incidence of MS in women and men, and this was my, my it is my favorite topic, the why women, why more women get MS, and this is from 1950 to 2015, and you can see that in the 70s, the women uh, get ahead men uh, uh, and is still increasing. And when we, when we started to focus on this issue, because we were looking up the incidence of MS uh, during the last 60 years, when we looked at the population from 50 to 2009 and found that the incidence of MS has more doubled than women, than men. So you can see it's, it's 8.5 in women and, and men, but the most interesting is the next uh, slide, where we compared, this is for men and this is for women, so we compared the relative incidence rate in 1950 to 2010 in different age groups. So we looked at which were the, the, the highest relative increase, and you can see at the, both sexes compared to the 1950s, in the ages over 50, the increase was most prominent. In women also the younger, uh, up, up, to, up to 20. So again, we can see it's a common disease also for young, but for the older one. However, it's also how do we define old, or older or elderly or aging? So, and, and, and we cannot explain this with ascertainment bias because in Denmark, everybody has equal access to MRI and, uh, and equal access to, to medical, uh, to healthcare. So there is no gender differences there. So, then, then some, how about clinical presentation? And I would love to show you Danish database is under analysis. However, there has been other groups presenting, for example, the Cleveland Clinic, who uh, looked at the incidence cohort over 60 years, over a five-year period, and found that 8% was clinical isolated syndrome, 33% was relapsing remitting MS, 23% was secondary progressive MS, and 32% is primary progressive MS. As you can see, when we talk about all aging MS population, the disease type is very heterogeneous. Um, and uh, also they look at that of the error MS and CIS, 46% 46 
of patients over 60 years had MRI with GAD enhancement, which means active inflammation, uh, even though myelitis was the common initial clinical syndrome. So these patients may are eligible for treatment. Then another, another group in Kuwait, they have an MS registry, they looked at a prevalent cohort, a cross-sectional study, and they find that 10.7% was late onset MS uh, and the spinal cord presentation were more common. And in the British Columbia Clinic was only about 5% was late onset MS uh, and of those were uh, about 55% of PPMS. So you can see the distribution is very, very different. Uh, then the effect of age of the clinical course. This is an emerging question and some of the registry try to address uh, these questions. And we know that advanced age indicates a shorter interval to disability progression and higher rate of progression when it begins. However, it is very important to distinguish whether it's independently the age or the, or the lesion localization or the clinical phenotype who drive this disability progression. And I think this is a really good study uh, conducted in the LORSEP cohort that also started in 1998 in the, in the Lorraine region. And they looked at about 7% 7, about 7 of the uh, patients who started over the age of 50 and found that age was strongly associated with poor prognosis independently. For, uh, so age was associated with disability progression independently of the of the, uh, of the progressive phenotype, and this association was mainly in the relapsing remitting phase. So, and also the late onset was a strong predictor for the conversion to secondary progression phenotype. Therefore, um, and, and, and the progression rate was actually more even in the primary progressive MS. So they concluded that even though there is a heterogeneous mixture of phenotypes, the rapidity of deeper, uh, disability progression in the whole color is not due to the higher frequency of PPMS. Uh, uh, age in RRMS is independently and strongly associated with disability progression. Then the Kuwait cohort, they find that a shorter time to reach EDSS sex compared to younger patients. However, when we look at phenotype and uh, symptoms, we have to remember there is multiple sclerosis and there is age. There are also some complications and, and symptoms who are associated with age and not only MS. And this gives a more complex combination. For example, falls and uh, cognitive decline also associated with age, uh, and it may be a synergistic effect. I will not, uh, and, and, and why is that? I will not go deep into immunology, especially after the, the first two uh, presentation, but uh, we know that the contribution of age to the, to the more severe course of MS uh, is due to the weakening of both the innate and adaptive components of the immune system, but also the remyelination which becomes less robust with uh, advanced age. Therefore, the compensatory and reparative mechanisms may negatively impact uh, remyelination and, 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 and compensatory mechanisms, as this may ex uh, explain the less response to uh, treatment. Then when we look at inflammation and degeneration, there has been uh, uh, some, some, some good pathological studies showing that uh, degeneration is more profound and there is less inflammation. And the MS lesion, lesion is actually very dynamic and it varies with patient age, disease, the disease age and the phenotype. And with increased patient age and longer disease duration, the chance of having an active lesion is less 
it's most likely to have a slowly expanding lesion, which is associated to progressive disease and an accelerated disability accumulation. How about MRI? Is it different from the aging population in, um, and in, in, the, in the younger population? And we have to remember, and these studies did not distinguish between different phenotypes, but we know that persons without MS has a yearly brain loss of about 1% from middle life and accelerates about a half percent at 60 years of age. Compared to that, the annual decrease of brain volume in patients with MS is range from from a half to one percent, and this proceeds relentlessly through the core course of MS. And the rate of brain atrophy is, has been shown to be an indicator of disability progression. Studies are sh shown as especially secondary progressive patients are up to 10 to 14 fold great matter atrophy when compared to relapsing remitted patient and healthy contours. And also progressive patients have more uh, cervical um, medullar lesion, especially higher, uh, higher cervical cord lesion load and the lower cross-sectional area when compared to relapsing MS phenotype. And all of those are independent contributors to higher disability le levels. So older patients have worse odds to uh, or there was us to keep uh, a lower disability level. Then another important thing are comorbidities. Uh, we, with age, people like accumulate diseases. And there has been rather good studies in Canada and also in Denmark and in some of the countries where you can, you can link different registries by the unique CPR number. And there is evidence, there is a higher occurrence of, of cardio and cerebrovascular comorbidities uh, after, after MS onset. It's also almost half of the persons with MS over 60 years has high blood pressure and high cholesterol. And over a lifetime, the chance of this, uh, over a lifetime for an MS patient, the, the risk of depression is 50%, but it's only 15% for a, for a background population. And 30% of patients experience anxiety. We also showed in Denmark, there is a higher occurrence of epilepsy, even Parkinson's disease and sleep disorders. We know that comorbidities contribute to diagnostic delay because it's confused the symptom, but also treatment delay. We know that vascular comorbidities has shown to increase uh, the decline in walking ability. So MS patients with, uh, without vascular disease had in mean 18 years to, 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 uh, decline, uh, to, to lose the ability of walking while uh, uh, MS patients with heart disease uh, had only 12 years. Uh, we looked at the mortality in Denmark that looked at, at also that all vascular comorbidities, but also psychiatric comorbidities, lung com uh, disease, diabetes, and cancer, of course, uh, is associated with an increased mortality. That has socioeconomic consequences. Disease duration and comorbidities uh, increase the risk of being divorced and a broken relationship, but also a lower income. And the disease, it, this challenges the disease man management, uh, also the management of symptoms, but also disease modifying treatment due to the polypharmacy. Then considerations for therapy. Should we treat these patients? Do we have any evidence for this? The randomized controlled trials for existing disease modifying therapy excluded aging people with MS. So we have little evidence. The majority of DMTs failed in progressive trials. However, we know that people, persons were treated, so DMT have contributed to a more stable disease and to longevity. How about age-dependent efficacy of disease-modifying therapy? We have very little evidence, uh, and there has been a big meta-analysis of all clinical trials where the inclusion of older people was rather uh, small but they found there has been no efficacy on disability of uh, accumulation when people are over the age of 55. So the treatment stopped, uh, the treatment effectiveness stopped at age of 55. 
we looked at we we, we compared in Denmark uh, a group of people who started treatment early within two years uh, after disease onset and people who started within eight years after disease onset and we found that there has been a benefit to start early however when we looked at the age it was actually the the, the difference disappeared already at age 45 how about uh, so we have to look at the age of patient and we have to look at the age of the disease. So it may be a better effect in a late onset MS and a pa and, 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 uh, and, uh, or, or a, a patient who has been treated for 20 years when the efficacy uh, slows down. How about DMT discontinuation? There are experts saying that we should consider discontinuation after the age of 60. And uh, there has been a study showing that about 30% uh, of patients uh, discontinued, uh, of most of them of the physician, ad phys uh, neurologist advice, and 10% started again because of uh, disability uh, deterioration. Then when we look at these clinical trials, the EXPAND trial for ocrelizumab versus interferon beta, the age limit is set to 55, and there is another drug on the pipeline, Siponibon, for secondary progressive MS, the EXPAND study, and I looked that up today at the clinical trials go. It's uh, 60 years. So, uh, so this would be a challenge to, to get some evidence uh, about treatment efficacy and safety. And just uh, one of the last slides, that, uh, but how about patient concern about aging with MS? There has been a survey conducted by the Danish MS Society and showed that about 30% of patients who responded was over 55. They had more likely to have secondary progressive form. More than 60% were dependent of help from others, and about 30% received professional help, uh, home nurse or, or, or um, nursing home. The dependence were due to physical and cognitive decline, and I didn't talk about cognitive decline when we all know that the cognitive decline is an important factor in disability progression. However, the cognitive decline in MS is very different than Alzheimer, and there has been no, no evidence that should be a higher comorbidity of Alzheimer disease in MS. Cases are described, but it should not have a higher risk. And... Uh, most of the patients over 55, they were more likely to be living without a partner, but all married people over 60 were dependent of their spouses. So my last slide about future studies. The increasing prevalence of the elderly individuals with MS combined with a lack of data about safety and efficacy of current DMT necessitates studies specific to this population. A substantial proportion of elderly pe people with MS will consider discontinuing DMT, and there is not enough data to provide an evidence-based recommendation. And because it's so difficult to have uh, re uh, randomized controlled trials for this population, real-world studies are important within the context of big and longitudinal registry to identify important clinical characteristics and the impact of DMT in this population with MS. And then thank you for your invitation, and this is my slowly expanding team at the Danish MS Registry. <laughs> thank you.